Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my good friend, the great Paul Barron, and uh, we are bringing you another exclusive and a very fun uh, interview with a dear friend of uh, mine for many, many years. Uh, he's from Argentina and uh, he began his studies on trumpet when he was just nine years old and very influenced uh, originally through, by Louis Armstrong and uh, musicians of that era. He later on established himself as one of the leading voices of the jazz generation uh, at that time in South America, uh, touring and recording extensively with uh, all the big groups uh, and soloists on that continent. Gustavo represented Argentina by participating in the biggest, most important festivals out there. And his beautiful trumpet playing has been featured in the groups of uh, people like Gato Barbieri, the Michel Legrand Orchestra, and as well, he was a founding member of two of Latin America's most important jazz groups, uh, those being the Buenos Aires Jazz Quartet and Quinta Plus. So uh, later on in his career, uh, in 1975, uh, Gustavo emigrated to Stockholm, Sweden, uh, it's never been easy for uh, trumpet players and jazz musicians, as you uh, might uh, know, but uh, Gustavo established himself there and became one of the top call um, artists up there, tr working with everybody from the Swedish Radio Jazz Group to the Stockholm Jazz Orchestra, and he's been in the company of many, many prominent guests, including people like uh, Bob Brookmeyer, Jim McNeely, Bob Mincer. Uh, he's toured around with people like Joe Lovano, Phil Woods, Maria Schneider, uh, John Schofield, the list goes on and on. And he's made regular tours uh, with a very interesting uh, group that I always loved, uh, the Klaus Ignacic Quintet, which also featured uh, Claudio Roditi. And uh, so he's made many recordings of his own. He's been on a ton of other people's recordings, including uh, people like Paquito de Rivera, Carlos Francetti. Uh, and uh, he's toured all over the place, not only Europe, but he's been to uh, La all over Latin America, to, the, to places like India, to Vietnam, all over the place. So welcome, Gustavo Bergali. So great to have you here. Thank you, Bobby. Fantastic introduction. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow, that was an amazing I, I, introduction. Gustavo, welcome. Um, I'm thank you, out, Paul. I'm going to throw out the first question, if you don't mind. And I'm very curious to know, um, as I'm sure everybody is here, uh, what was your first introduction to the trumpet? Was it at nine years old, or did you did you always wanted to play the trumpet even before that? So tell us what, what your uh, main influence was back then as a child. Well, I, I, I was playing in the kindergarten. I was playing my harmonica, small harmonica, you know? And then I started to, to play a little guitar. And then my brother was studying to be a guitar player, you know? My dad wanted him to be a guitar player, not, not only full time, but just to have somebody in the family, the family group to play some instrument. So they chose the, the, the guitar for him. And he was, he was an amazing student in everything he did, you know. He was always, always doing his best constantly. He was uh, the best student in the school, the best student in the university. But I was the black sheep in the family. I was totally opposite than him. And uh, once he came with two records, 278, 12th Street Rock, with Louis Armstrong on the Hot Five, and the Muscle Rumble. And he said to me, listen, little guy, this you have to listen. This is the music that you have to listen. And he put the record, and it was like a, Mike Tyson kicked my <laughs> jaw, knocked me down. <laughs> And I said, well, this is my instrument and this is my music for the rest of my life. And nobody could put that idea away from my mind, you know? So you from fell in head. love with it right that instant. I have to say that Louis Armstrong became, became my second father. 
My bi biological father was a beautiful father, like my mother. I, we, we grew up, we were talking with Bobby and myself uh, for a while ago, that we had a good ch childhood, you know, I had a wonderful childhood. But I can say that Sachmo was my second father, spiritual. He, he led me through all my life, you know. For me, it's, it's like a, God sent him to the earth to show the, the way, you know. And, and uh, he's the main musician, jazz musician in the jazz history for me, for me. Did you ever have so a I, chance to hear him live? Yes, I did. 1955. He, they came with the All Stars from Buenos Aires, and my parents took me there to the show. Oh wow! And I was crying all the time, Bobby. <laughs> it was so emotional, everything, you know. And then he, they, 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 the, the Toastmaster introduced the whole band first, Barry Deems, and then the bass player, and then Willie, Ke Willie um, Billy Kyle. And then Edmund Horn from Milan, and then Sachmo, Louis Armstrong Sachmo, and he didn't decide, he didn't appear. And all of a sudden, he from behind the curtain he did, did like this and look at the audience. I said, and I ah! <laughs> started to cry. <laughs> it was a fantastic program, fantastic. Well, that that's my my main influence. And then I wanted to play trumpet, and my parents didn't want me to play trumpet at nine at, at the age of nine. So I could I could paint too because I, I went to the art school. So I could draw, draw and paint trumpets and cut it with a his, with his scissor and do it like I was playing in front of the mirror, you know? <laughs> and the other thing I was doing I was, uh, I was uh, taking the, the hunk of the, the bicycle. Oh, yeah. And I took, I took away the, the pair, that pair. That, that, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I insisted, I insisted to, to my parents to, to, to buy a trumpet for me, but they, they refused. And there was a kind of a little store close to my place where I live. Did you see the man with the horn? Mm -hmm. Kirk Douglas, when I, Kirk I Douglas. saw it at that time, I saw it 11 times. I was so fascinated with the film. And that store where the little Kate go with Art Asar, the, the black trumpet player, the guy. It was very similar to this store. All the all the instruments, the trumpets were hanging from the from the ceiling, you know, like this. And I was on the bicycle there watching that that w window and imagined that I was going to buy a trumpet. So you know what I did? I rang the bell to the, the to my friends from the from the from the from the block, and I asked their parents for money. I begged their parents for money. And then I went by myself with that money and I bought the horn. So the community bought you the first horn. The, the community <laughs> bought the first horn. <laughs> so when my father saw the horn, it was a mess. It was a mess. But then, then I had to go to the, to the neighbors and pay. Pay, oh, <laughs> pay everybody back. <laughs> yeah. And then it's done. And then, and then it was a very, very... I have it here, the horn. I have it here. Really? God, it's I wish I had the first horn that I ever had. I should have kept it. It was a flugelhorn, a rotary valve flugelhorn, totally destroyed, very bad, in bad conditions. Now it's even worse. <laughs> but um, when, my pa when my father realized that I was really into that, he said to me, well, I buy a, a trumpet for you if you go to a teacher. I said, yes, of course. So he bought a real trumpet, and then I went to a teacher two years, the trumpet player, professional trumpet player. But that's the only time that I, I studied trumpet. Then I got some help from another professional, a lead, lead trumpet player professional from the, one of the TV channels in Buenos Aires. I took some lessons from him. But I was more, I would call it self-thought. Not only that, in music in general, because I went to the art school, so I was studying painting. And the, everything related to jazz and music, it was my own, done by my own, you know? Well, I didn't realize that. That's. That's amazing. <laughs> so after Louis Armstrong, who was your, your next big jazz uh, influence? At the age of 18, good question, Paul. Beautiful. Uh -huh. At the age of 18, a, a friend of my brother lent me a record of Clifford Brown, Max Roach, in concert. George Dew, Tenderly, I Can Get Started. That was the, the other, the other, the first one was the left hook 
from Mike Tyson. This was the right, the right hook of Mike Tyson. <laughs> <clears throat> and I realized that I couldn't play with that sound that I had. I had the Armstrong sound. And the f I couldn't play the way Clifford played. I realized that I had to change all my technique, my way, my concept of playing the horn. And I was searching for, for suggestions and from, the, from, the, from the professional ones in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. In Buenos Aires, there were five TV steady TV orchestras in the TV channels. Um, so there were, there were a lot of uh, musicians working. And that was a, well, that was a gang that worked working on the TV. And then there was another one playing recording, professional recordings, you know, pop artists. And there was another gang playing for commercials for TV. It was a big producer. So it was a, very, a lot of activity in Buenos Aires at that time. There were a lot of trumpet players playing fantastic, you know, very good lead and stuff. Some, a few of them were soloists too, but they didn't, they didn't understand what I meant with the sound of Clifford, you know. They couldn't understand. So it took me a lot, of, a lot of years to realize what I had to do with my embouchure and my, my way of playing to, to create that sound and to be flexible, to go away from the, that that's such more school, you know. So were there a lot of jazz musicians down there at oh, that yeah. time? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Here in Buenos Aires was a jazz center for Latin America. Oh, okay. Jazz, go, jazz started here in the twenties. Some orchestra started to play jazz, you know. It, of course it was not the um, Shelly Roll Morton stuff or thing like this, but it was a little bit more commercial, but it was kind of a jazz, commercial jazz, you know. It's interesting how everything, travels you know and how it oh, yeah. how how jazz has been gone all over the world but yet how different parts of the world you know they have sort of their own they've created their own version of it you know it's yeah, like I, I think about that when i when i listen to like ecm records i mean that's kind of like european jazz to me you know mm -hmm. and the way things have gone over there so I, I did it. It took me many years to find out how, how, what I had to do. You know, I, I was playing with my, my the, the old embouchure like this, you know. Mm. So I, I realized that if I could put my chops in a pucker, like a pucker, mm. you know, mm -hmm. putting my more, more meat mm. into the cup, I could, I could um, create a kind of a fatter, warm and rounded sound, you know, and not so brilliant sound. So it took me a lot of job, a lot of job. I was trying Caruso, I was trying everything, you know, but they couldn't find it, but I found it by myself, you know. Typically, the problem with a lot of people that go to school and, and they take lessons, they get very locked into how they should yeah. play yeah, and yeah, they yeah, come yeah. out not, not sound, they sound like robots a lot of times and they don't experiment to try to find their own voice. It's true, it's true, you know? it's true, it's true. I mean, you have uh, a unique voice and a unique, beautiful sound when you, you play, Bobby. it's Thank incredible. Well, let much. me ask you this then, coming out of this subject to continue on this subject, what, what was, what was the first kinds of gigs you had down there playing? Well, here it was very popular, hot jazz. So the first thing it was like a, like a Louis Armstrong Hot 5, Hot 7, the group that we had. We were playing Jelly Roll Morton tunes, you know, and all that, that repertoire of stuff. We were traditionalists. We hated modern jazz. We were cultivating the, the jazz from the, from the 20s. Not even after the 30s. Many people said that after the 30s, when Armstrong started to play with the, the Louis Russell Orchestra, doing all those fantastic recordings, there the jazz was finished. Oh. <laughs> started the, the, purest, the, the purest started back in the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but Clifford changed all my life, you know, Clifford changed. So we were playing those kind of things. We did the Weeper, Once in a While, Musket Rumpel, 
the jazz band ball, jazz me blue, all that repertoire, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we went into the more Louis Armstrong all star. We went from the hot seven, hot five, into the all star, you know. And then and then we we became more and more more Dixieland. Then we I, we went into the Eddie Condon with Wild, Wild Bill oh, Davis yeah. and Bobby mm -hmm. Bobby Hackett, you know. And then Clifford came up. So at what time was uh, was bebop? becoming more popular in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Oh, you know? immediately. Oh, immediately. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Immediately. Already were, those big, were those big stars like Dizzy and those guys, yeah. were they touring down in Argentina? Sure, in those years? sure. Okay. Dizzy came with a big orchestra, with a big band. Quincy Jones on trumpet and uh, Phil Woods and Melba Liston, yeah, okay. Cecil Payne. And that was a revolution. That was a revolution here in Argentina. It was a shock for everybody, for all the musicians. They had fantastic success. The theater, they stay one week. The theater was full packed and the people outside. And you know, here, here, as much as in the United States, the cowboy is like a kind of a symbol for the people an, from the countryside. An icon, yeah. An icon. Here are the gauchos. Uh -huh. And this, he came to the first concert dressed as a gaucho in a horse. <laughs> of course. Yeah. That? In the theater, in the, in the big avenue, like Broadway, like this, he, with, uh -huh. the, with the horse. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> I bet the people loved him because of that, too. Yeah, 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 yes. Well, that's and, interesting and, for me to hear because a lot of times, you know, we, we, we understand this is where it started in large part, all that music and that, but to think about at that time, even with the, the travel, the travel situation was a lot harder. There were a lot fewer flights and there was a lot of trains and, you know, automobile travel and stuff like that. The, pl the planes, when they were on land, they, they were not, not like this, they were like this, you know. <laughs> And then even back then, you know, having a uh, black black folk traveling was difficult, you know, to travel here sure, in the sure. states, you know. Sure, 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 sure. So, well, that's it. That's cool. That's very interesting. So, so you you then you're playing gigs. You're you're getting older here, and then you're what else were you doing? What other kind? What kinds of gigs were you doing? before you moved, before you immigrated? Uh, interesting question. I started to play with pop artists because I realized that I had to be professional with the instrument if I wanted to be in a good shape with the instrument. So I didn't, I didn't like especially the musician life, you know. But I, I did it because I loved to have my trumpet, our trumpet that we have, all of us, with me constantly, the 24 hours a day, you know? And the only one was to be a professional. So I became professional and then I started to play in sessions and studio sessions, some theater, uh, musical shows, some gigs on the TV. I was young, so it was, uh, it was exciting to have that type of life, you know, touring with the pop rules being so popular, you know? Mm -hmm. touring through some countries here down in Latin America. Now, were and, these Argentine pop groups or were they pop groups? Yeah, 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 yeah. Argentine, okay. Argentine pop, yeah, Argentine okay. pop groups, yeah, yeah, yeah. Traveling all over South America. It sounds like there was, there was just a big flourishing scene. I mean, here in the States, this is the same, you know, there was a lot of work at, at oh, one yeah. time. It's different now, but oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's yeah. nice to uh, know that there was a lot there. So, yeah, sure. so to move ahead a little bit, um, you know, for all our friends watching out there, uh, you know, Gustavo moved, he emigrated to Sweden and that's where I first met you. Uh, and I met you, boy, it has to have been probably Maybe. close to 35 years, 33 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I saw him playing with, he was rehearsing. And I, 
I don't remember if it, who it was with. It was with a big band. I don't remember which big band it was with, but I remember him playing. I, I think you guys were just playing A Train or some great arrangement of a Duke Ellington tune. And I just remember why my wife and I snuck into the club. There was nobody there. We just sat and he had invited us and I heard him play. And I was like, oh my God, this is so ridiculous. It was amazing. <laughs> and then and then he took us out and started to show us around. And, and you know, Gustavo, he not only speaks great English, I think Italian and Portuguese, but he speaks great Swedish. You know, we we joke around <laughs> sometimes in Swedish, but uh, my Swedish is terrible. But he's the real deal. But why don't you tell everybody why, you know, how and what year it was and how, why you went over to Sweden in the first place? I, I had a friend of mine. I have. I have a friend of mine, a very good lead trumpet player called Americo Bellotto. And he was he was uh, living in Sweden. And he was very popular at that time in Sweden. He had all the gigs, you know. He was uh, organizing the um, trumpet teams for session, for recording sessions, you know. All, he had all the gigs. He, they wanted everybody to have him as a lead. And then he knew that I wanted to travel, to go somewhere, especially Sweden. He arranged a gig for me playing musical shows one year on tour to get the definitely work permission to stay in Stockholm. So I decided to go there. I went there. At the same time as I went there, the Militar Coup d'etat happens in Argentina. And my brother disappeared two years. They took my brother. Mm. So I couldn't go back to Argentina. Fortunately, the people that were the, the promoters of this musical show they wanted me to stay. So they were, they were renewing the contract so I could apply for to stay for four months more. You know, it was like a four contracts for four months each contract. And after the first year, I applied for the definitely were permission to stay there. And then I could stay in Stockholm. And then I started to settle down in Stockholm and I started to work very much in Stockholm Thanks, my dear friend that was um, leading all the trumpet sections. Now, was he from Argentina or where yeah, was he? Yeah, from Argentina, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. He played with Minor Ferguson Band and he played with Charlie Mingo's group. And he, he, he was very, a great, a great lead, you know, a great lead. Everybody wanted to, to study with him, to take lessons with him, you know. So I started to work a lot. But I wanted to play jazz because I, I am a jazz musician, so I wanted to play jazz. The jazz atmosphere ignored me. I thought that maybe they see me playing in a big band solo, as, he, as, as, you, as you heard me playing with that band in the rehearsal. On the TV shows, there were a lot of TV shows. Still, the, the big orchestra were on TV in, in Sweden, uh, working shows and stuff like this. And then they could realize that I was um, a jazz player. So they, the telephone was going to start to ring, you know. Forget it. Nobody cared about me, nobody. But the gigs, as a professional, they started to be more and more film music, shows, recording sessions, etc. So I was working a lot. So in Sweden, you know, it's a social democracy, social democrat country. It's not communist. It's a social democracy, you know. It's a democracy which socialist minded in terms of um, the programs how, and healthcare and all those healthcare, things. Healthcare, yes, yes, right, yeah, you're right, you're right, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, Bobby. So um, just was supported by the culture department. It's very, very good organized all the things. The Swedish Jazz Federation have control over 100 clubs in the whole country. So you can arrange tours and then there are, there are areas in the country where you can, you can call and organize tours in that area, like uh, 10 or 15 gigs in that area. And then you can go to another area and then another 10 or 15 gigs in that area. So the main jazz of the Swedish Jazz Federation is in Stockholm. It's a jazz club called Fashion. Wonderful jazz club. So I realized that I had to do something because I was going to be crazy, not not playing jazz. 
I wanted to be a jazz musician in Sweden, not a, just a professional playing gigs and stuff like this. So I went by myself to the club and I was sitting, sitting down in a, in, a, in a dressing room, in the back room, playing by myself every afternoon. And then once came a tenor player, very talented tenor player. And he started to, we started to play duets, both playing standards and stuff like this. Yeah. And there was a quintet to one day that was going to perform in the evening. And they, were rehe they had to rehearse in the afternoon there in the club. Two, two tenors and rhythm section. And none of those two tenors could make it. So they asked the guy, the tenor player that was there sitting with me in the back room, if he would like to join the, 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 the group and to play in the evening. And then he named me, there is another, it's a trumpet player here, plays fantastic. Uh, do, you, do you think that he could be too? Yes, of course. So I, that was my first gig. And from there, I started the group and we started to, to tour all over the country. And then I started to be a jazz musician full time. I started to have connections. I put it together in my own quintet. I was supported by the culture department. I was traveling in South America with my quintet. Festivals in Sweden, the Scandinavian. And I started to be in Europe. And then, uh, and then once Claudio Roditi came to, to this jazz club, the main jazz club in Stockholm, with a, with a trio. And then he told me to come to play with, it, with him. I said, no, nah, come on. I want to sit down and to listen to you. No, but come, come, come. I want you, I want them to listen to you. So maybe when I can't make it, you can be in my, my, my sub. So I took my trumpet and they liked it so much that we decided to do a quintet and we started to, to travel all over Europe, you know. Every year during 15, 16 years, we did 12 records together, Claudia and me. Well, I knew you did some. I didn't know you did 12 wow. with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did 12. What a great player. I mean, I've, I've, I've met, I had the chance to talk and hang out with him maybe two, maybe three times. He was always real cool. Yeah. Claudio was uh, from Brazil, from Minas Gerais, but he lived mm -hmm. in Rio and he, he moved to, to, to Boston to attend the um, Berkeley School of Music. And he lived in he Mexico had, City for a while, he told me. Yeah, probably, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah probably, yeah. So how but, many years um, were you in Sweden, Ben, before moving back to uh, Buenos Aires? Oh, it was 30 years, 30 years. But Sweden, after 10 years, became a place to come back, to play gigs, to make my laundry, to pay my bills, and keep going. You know, <laughs> but sometimes, and then I become, I became steady in the stock. I was one of the fundators of the Stockholm Jazz Orchestra. And then the radio jazz group that is uh, supported by the, the radio, the radio system there, you know, it's a culture thing, you know. And then I got a contract there, the radio jazz group and the radio orchestra. And then I started to play with the different musicians. I started to be more popular. And then with John Scofield, with uh, Joe Lovano, with Bob Minzer. But you've toured down in Argentina and all over with Joe Lovano too, right? With your own, your guys' Yeah, it was in, in, in Argentina, in Argentina. Joe Lovano, Joe Lovano has, he has more relatives in Argentina than in the United States. Because, you know, the Italian, they went to, to two different places, or United States or Argentina, you know. Argentina is very much Italian. My I know, Italian. from all the, all the restaurants you've taken us to. In Argentina? Yeah. When we used yeah, to yeah, go, yeah. you would take us to all these really cool Italian places and introduce us yeah. to all this great food. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I realized that um, nowadays it doesn't matter where you live, you know. My address, my email address doesn't, doesn't say dot com dot argentina you know this is not dot com so and now you can make phone calls all over the world doesn't cause nothing you can you can watch each other you know yeah that's great there's some really great things about technology there's a lot of it oh, i yeah. hate but there's some good things i mean and you still 
you know, uh, with the exception of this COVID thing for years, you're still, you're traveling between Argentina and Sweden, still playing, having career. Oh, in yeah. Both oh, places very much. Here. Very much. Yeah. I had to cancel gigs now in, in the 2020 for the pandemic, but I had to go there to teach summer courses and, and some concerts and some tours in Scandinavia and in Finland. I'm going very much to Finland too. Mm. When I've been touring with Klaus Ignacek, with Claudio Riditi, we have been touring all over Europe, all over Europe. And that that gave me the possibility to come in contact with the, with the, the local scenes, you know. The jazz musicians come to listen to you. And then from there comes musicians that ask you if you would like to come back and can do a project together, you know, and stuff like this. It's like a chain, chain of uh, different uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. So what's your favorite uh, country to, to tour to and, and where you're most well received and, uh, and, and, and best supported? Well, Sweden, definitely. Sweden has been the most. But Germany is in the second place. Germany is fantastic. Fantastic. In Germany, you have three steady orchestras in the radio stations. The WDR in Cologne, the NDR in Hamburg, and FDR in Frankfurt. And, you know, they are jazz orchestra. They do jazz. I thought I thought they were radio and TV orchestra, comping artists, singers, or whatever. No, no, no. Everything is jazz, and they have a fantastic salary, fantastic support. You know, and sometimes they they complain. You know, the the the, the, the rehearsals are from ten from nine to to twelve to twelve, and then from one to three. And they have 14 salary. One salary, well, you have the 12 salaries. And then you have one salary more for, you get, you get I don't know how you call it in English, it's a extra, like a extra salary. Like overtime kind of thing or something? No, I'm not no, sure. no, 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 or no, no, no. Or bonus, a bonus? They say like a bonus, yes. And then you get a salary more to make your own projects outside the, the orchestra. Mm. So they get 14 salaries and they still complain, you know, they have Mercedes, <laughs> they have houses, beautiful houses, swimming pool or whatever. And they are, no, because it's, it's a shit, you know. Are you, are you nuts, I said. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what you have, guys. We, it's the only country in the world who has this. We have a great saying here. It's a band leader joke. It says, do you know how to get a musician to complain? Give him a gig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there no, going to be food? You know, do we get a room? Do we, is our parking free? <laughs> <laughs> but you no, know we have we have a lot of uh, great Swedish trumpet players on here, and we have some um, some German uh, Germans on here as well. Um, but we do have a big Swedish contingent of people, and I know a lot of them personally. So it's it's uh, it's going to be extra fun for them to see you here because I know uh, with a couple of them, I've talked about you with them and how much respect everybody has for your you're playing over there you know you are one of the giants um oh thank you and man. i and i part part of this is like i also you have such an interesting background uh, but i think there's just so many brilliant musicians all over the world that that should be known more about so at least uh our hope is that this will get you in front of more people to learn more about you you know no oh, thank you bobby thank you thank so, you paul too Thank you very so, much, Paul. Welcome. So we know that the level of trumpeting, the level of instrument making is very high, particularly in Northern Europe. And it's getting even more in Southern Europe now and better. I mean, they're even starting to make nice instruments out of China and other places that I've seen. But how, tell us a little bit about the level of 
players playing, how it might compare in Argentina and that part of the world compared to Europe. And tell us a little bit about trumpet making and mouthpieces and stuff, because I know when I was down there, uh, for, for those of you that might not know, I, I created a really fun recording and it was done with a with an orchestra and we had an international group of people i took people from america with me to buenos aires uh, gustavo was a guest uh from it we took people from europe over there and and we used members of the sinfonia nacional de buenos aires uh there to also accompany us and we spent a couple of weeks down there uh rehearsing and recording and creating this project and then we we finished it up but yeah. on on one of our days off which we had very few days off during during that time Gustavo took me to a really cool place, um, a cool music store called All Brass. And I remember it. I wore my shirt out. I need a new shirt. <laughs> but uh, I think I got a mouthpiece down there and they were talking about developing new, new developments and trumpets and stuff at the time. Are they still yeah, doing yeah. that down there? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have, have developed very much. They are doing fantastic mouthpieces and the uh... The, the repair very good. They are, how do you call it? The people who repair trum trumpets. How do you call it in English? Uh, repairman. Or, yeah, repairman. Uh, or... Repairman. Okay. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. So they are, they are very good. They are, they are growing and growing and growing and buying more stuff. And so the, the workshop is, is bigger now. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many, not many, but I mean, here in Buenos Aires, there are like a, five or six of them, you know, they compete with each other, of course. Mm -hmm. Kind of like little boutique manufacturers yeah. on a, on yeah, a very yeah. small level, but making yeah. really quality instruments. They are planning, they are planning to make trumpets. Now the whole, the whole thing, because uh, the piston case is the question, you know, but they are planning to do it. They are very good. In the, in the right direction now. So that could be fantastic if we started to do that. But what I wanted to, to, to explain is why I didn't play jazz during five years in Stockholm oh, okay, when I came okay. there. The thing is that the jazz music in Stockholm, in Sweden, is considered culture. Jazz became a main music in Sweden because they have folk music, but they don't have a popular music. And then jazz became very, very important for the Swedish society. All the great jazz players from the United States, Charlie Parker, Louis Armstrong there was, was there already in the, in the beginning of the 30s. Billy Holiday, you name it, all of them. Charlie Parker recorded in Sweden. It's the only country outside the United States that he recorded. So it was a fantastic jazz activity in Sweden. Sweden doesn't, didn't go into the Second World War, you know, not in the First World War either. So they are well, have been always neutral. So the economy and the, the country was not destroyed by the war. So as soon as the war finished, all the jazz musicians started to come, you know. Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, you know, all of them. So it has a status as a culture, jazz music. And jazz musicians have a kind of economical support by the government to, to manage economically as a jazz musicians. When you don't have gigs, because it's impossible to have gigs with all, the, all the days in the year, you get a salary anyway from the state. You know. It's an employing, unemployment salary. So you can live with this. It's enough to pay the rent and to, to, to buy the food and to live and to, to go around, you know, to have a, to have a car or whatever, you know, it's, it's like unbelievable, the country. So they consider that the, the, the musicians that played in the commercial gigs, they consider them commercial, not artists. So they saw me on TV playing. They saw me, I could play jazz. I could play solos, but I was not a jazz musician because my, my conduct, my, my way of to have relationship with the music, it was commercial. 
Your regular job. Your regular job, of course. Even, even if they can hear you that you play jazz when you play, your policy in life is not, be, is not belong to an artist, somebody who takes music as an art expression. So that's why I went to the jazz club and I, I sat down there in the, in, the, in the back room to show them that I wanted to be with. And when they, they saw me that I was playing with this quintet and that I was traveling with this quintet, playing on tour, then, and then they started to have more respect for me. And then they started to call me for do, to do produ productions with the radio jazz group and stuff mm -hmm. like this. And through the radio jazz group, I had the opportunity to play with many fantastic jazz musicians, you know. So that, that was my relationship with jazz music in, in Sweden. And on the top of that is if you are coming from New York and you are a jazz musician, they put you the red carpet. You are very much welcome. If you come from another part of the United States, you are also very welcome, but not as much as you come from New York. This is what happened in Europe. If you come as a jazz musician to another country in Europe, well, let's hear, let's hear who plays better. But if you come from Argentina and you are a jazz musician, they said, oh, what the hell is doing this guy here? He should play cha-cha-cha, you know? The fight to be part of, of the scene as a jazz musician from Buenos Aires was tough. It was very tough until I understood that I had to dedicate my life to jazz music for them to respect me as a jazz musician. It took me five years. How did the commercial world start to look at you then? Now you're an artist. Does that mean that you're no longer a commercial musician? Well, I didn't care, Paul. Oh. I'm telling you, I didn't care. I, I don't know what they thought about me. <laughs> Doesn't but you were still was... doing commercial work at that time, Yeah, right? some, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. But uh, very, very careful, you know, because otherwise you become, again, commercial-minded, you know. You take mm -hmm. the music as a commercial concept of mm -hmm. your life. If you are a jazz musician, you have to be, your, your life should be as a jazz musician, you know. That's what they think. And they have the opportunity to be this with the, with the unemployment salary. Well, and, and like that's, that. yeah, that's the difference. I think there'd be a lot of people. In fact, you know, in talking, I remember talking to so many of my Swedish friends and they'd say, yeah, you know, we're planning and we're applying for a grant to be able to travel over to this country with yeah. the whole big band yeah. or we're going here, we're going there. You know, in fact, I remember some talking about traveling and doing a, a project with the Canadian because Paul, Paul, you're Canadian. Canadian, you know, uh, and they have something, I mean, like support for the arts like that. I mean, we have it to a degree, but it's a very small thing comparatively, you know. They, they Nowadays, they consider me, me Swedish. I represent Sweden internationally for them. They send me to my, with my group, me and my group as a Swedish culture ambassadors to play jazz all over the world. Well, you've lived there for so long, and you you yeah, understand and after, the culture, after, and you yeah, speak and after the language. I move here, it, after I move here, I go there once a year at least. Otherwise, I'm going twice or three times sometimes. It's so a nice I, place. I mean, there's a lot of cool things going on there, you know? Yeah. There's like anywhere, there's always parts of it that are really great, and there's other parts of it that you you may not enjoy as much. But, you know, overall, you know, I really like yeah. uh, Sweden. You know, my daughter lives there. My wife is from there. We have family there. Uh, it takes yeah. a bit to understand when you travel anywhere, the the culture and the mindset of those of the people there and then mm -hmm. once you kind of wrap your head around it uh, it becomes easier to enjoy you know one of the things i really do like about swedish people and i'm generalizing when i say this but you know i i think they're very they seem at first sometimes like they could maybe be a little standoffish, but the truth of the matter is it takes a while to, to be accepted, to know somebody. And then once you're comfortable around them, they're truly your friend. 
It's oh, not absolutely. something superficial. I mean, the joke that I always heard, you know, about America over there is, oh, have a nice day. That's so phony. That's so fake. But it's so, <laughs> such a thing here that we have ingrained in us, you know. You always sure, say, sure. hear that, you know. Sure, sure, um, sure. But, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of cool things there. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. It's a, it's a great country. It was an example for all Scandinavian the development and the industrial development, you know, there are fantastic things, you know. They are nine, nine million people and they have Volvo, the, the car Volvo, one of the greatest cars in the world. And a lot of things like this, Electrolux, you know, they they invented a lot of things, you know, the, the, zi the zip. The zipper, the yeah. Zip, the zipper is a, it's an invention, it's an invention. And like, Tetra there are pack. many. Tetra, Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak comes from Ikea. Sweden. Ikea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. No, there's a lot, but now they're so high tech and they're, you know, I mean, it's just a very educated society. And and the people that go there, I, that live there, that go through the schooling, the schooling is of the highest order. I mean, I mean, we know you remember Guto. Um, who yeah. was playing sax on our thing? He he emigrated over there um, from Brazil and uh, went to music school and everything. And uh, he's doing. I think he's doing pretty pretty well over there. He's a great player, but it's just such a high level. Everything is done. I feel like on a on a much higher level. So let's. Uh, you know, I know we're kind of running out of time here, but let's let's talk a little bit about about some of your your recordings. Tell us a little bit about some. Just pick pick like three of the your favorite recordings. I know you've just been on tons and tons of them. You oh, know, no. Three. Give us a few <laughs> recordings that really stand out, and tell us why, who they were with, and why why they're extra special to you. Now, how about? your recordings, the recordings you've made with your group. How about, oh, I know you've made not, a bunch of those. They are not, they are nothing to talk about. They are not oh, good. no, come on, seriously. You know, you've <laughs> recorded with some great people. I mean, like, I I guess I somehow missed that you had you had played with, you know, on some recordings with Paquito de Rivera, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But how was that? I mean, he's a great, you know, another great musician and a Cuban musician. And uh, where did you sure. guys record, and what was it? But I, I, I was, it was, it was not in a small group. It was a big band, you know. It was with Luz Olof, uh, Diego Rucola, which oh, is a yeah. trumpet player from Argentina, mm -hmm. who plays with Paquito. D. Coates, I think it was there too. Was this bass trombone player, fantastic trombone player, bass trombone player, Dave Taylor, perhaps. Dave Taylor, Dave Taylor. Thank you. Do you know Dave? I don't know him personally, but I, I, he's a wonderful musician, that's for sure. Unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. I think when I first met you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but were you playing with also with the George Grunts? No, uh, no, okay. no, 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 never, never, never. Okay, no, 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 okay. No, for no, some no. reason, I thought you had you had played on that band. That was always no. an interesting, an interesting group, also to to listen to. Um, how about recordings with one of the Stockholm, like with the Stockholm Jazz Orchestra? Did you have recordings with those guys? With that? Group? Yeah, yeah. Well, we did once with them. The music was Yuki Swatila. It was a drum. It was a drummer of the band, you know. He did arrangements, and I was I was a um, feature as a soloist there, in some tunes. And with the Stockholm Jazz Orchestra, we did with Bob Rumeyer or with Bob Minzer, with a lot of a lot of guys, uh, Swedish Swedish arrangers and composers too. I one one record that I like very much with Lick on Lick on it. I was doing a record with Lee Connors too. It's a very nice record. Mm -hmm. Music of Lars Gullin is a Swedish baritone player. Mm -hmm. He was like the uh, Jerry Mulligan of Sweden, right? I have, yeah, a, I yeah. think I have like a couple of my son's a sax player, and I gave him a couple of old records. I mean, the original pressing from like the 1950s, you know, of Lars Gullin. 
but uh, with his own voice. Eh? It was nothing to do with Jerry Mulligan. It was totally no, 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 no. Just that he played baritone, yeah, and he yeah, was yeah, the sure. music was kind of more West Coast style of music that I've heard. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Who was sure, the other sure. trumpet player he used to play with during that time? There was another really famous trumpet player from Sweden. Um, Rolf Eriksson. Yes, yes, Rolf Eriksson. Uh, well, Rolf Eriksson, I played a lot with Benny Bailey. You know who Benny Bailey was? Sure. Yeah, from Duke Ellington's band. Is it was that Benny? From... Benny Benny settled down in Sweden in Stockholm, so we, we were playing in a big band called Googie Hedrenio's Big Blues Band. And the trumpet section many times was Rolf Eriksson, Benny Bailey, and myself. You know, my me. Great time, great time, great musicians. When I first went over to Sweden many decades ago, it's changed now to a degree, but I remember watching television and my wife is from uh, the Southern part of, of Sweden. And so we would get, at the time, there was only three uh, television ch channels in Channel, Sweden. Channels, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now there's more, but back then there was three. And then we would get the one from Denmark. And so oh, yeah. I remember seeing um, the first time I was there. I mean, it was like the first night I was there. They had, if you don't know this guy, he's also fantastic. And you've probably worked with him a bunch. Uh, Jan Allen. And he's a oh, yeah. wonderful oh, trumpet yeah, player. And Fantastic a super player. smart, uh, I don't know, scientist or something uh, as well. But he had a, they had him on TV. That was so cool. Another time I remember seeing uh, Miles Davis and also another show from, from Denmark. I saw a show with uh, Pauli Mikkelborg, who's another great, uh, yeah, great player, great composer Pauli. over there. Uh, that, he was very cool. I got to, I spent a whole day with him one time. He invited me over and took me all over. It was a very, very fun, fun day. But just to see this stuff on regular TV, which is something we don't really experience here. They have I like know, a I Good know. Morning America show on a Sunday morning in Sweden. Good Morning Sverige show and yeah. it, it featured Håkan Hardenberger on there and playing and talking and everything and it was amazing to watch it yeah. for me it was really special you know? Håkan Hardenberger is a fantastic trumpet player do you oh, know yeah. Paul Håkan I I've not met no but I sure am a big fan <laughs> fantastic yeah I we haven't are, met are, him either I hope to meet him sometime but we are good to... friends we are good friends he's yeah. a great guy fantastic instrumentalist we've been watching him play all the Charlie A things online, you know, now mm. during this, this pandemic. And it's been amazing to, to watch him. So let me ask you this, cause this has been on, uh, we asked this of just about everybody, but what has Gustavo Bergali been practicing? You know, what have you been doing during this pandemic? Are you, have you been, are you still practicing regularly? How is, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Every day, every day, every day. So what do you Every do day. when you practice? Tell us a little bit about your practice period or periods. Do you practice multiple times a day or do you just sit down and play for a certain amount of time and that's it? Uh, I play a certain amount of time, but sometimes I pick up the horn. Sometimes I am, I am alone here at home. I'm not married. I don't live with anybody. So I do whatever I want with whom I want in the way I want. <laughs> you know, whenever in you the, want, <laughs> in the time, in the time I want. <laughs> but um, when I practice, I practice. Um, I, I I used to start with a um, low register flexibility. You know, playing G to warm up, G and C, G and C, soft and not for a long time. You know, and then I rest. I let the the blood circulate. You know. And then I do flexibility exercises. I'm, I start to be more and more complex. And then staccato exercises too. And then I started to play. I rest all the time. And then I start to play. I play tunes, standards. I have, uh, I have um, an idea to replace the gigs, having the gigs here at my home by myself. I, program it like a concert, you know, with five tunes for the first set and five tunes for the second set. And then I play them. 
as I am in the concert, I play the, the melody and I play two or three choruses, you know, with the, the rhythm section, you know. I re, I a real pro, you know, the, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the rhythm section. And then I let a, an imaginary solo is to take over two or three chorus. And then I play, I play trade and then I play the, the melody. And then I rest like a, some minutes between the, the tunes and I play the next tune, you know. I do a kind of a, like a like a concert at home. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. Not to lose the the um, the the condition, you know. Mm. But nothing is compared with with the playing with real musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is ir- irrepressible, irreplaceable. We had um, Sal Cracciolo and Adolfo Acosta on here from Tower of Power uh, some some months back. And I had talked to Sal. We, we have the same birthday he and I do. So every week t- we stay in touch, but every year on our birthday, one of us calls each other and we always chat. And um, I was asking him how he stays in shape just to play his show and what, you know, what he does. And he says, Tower of Power, they have a it basically a whole record and they got all their tunes all recorded minus their track. And he says, I put on my headphone, I warm up just like you. And I warm up, I go through my basics, get myself going. And then I put my headphones on and I do two 75 minute sets, you know, with a half hour break in between. Yeah, or something. yeah, exactly, exactly. And exactly, he yeah. said, that's just, then I know I'm ready to be able to do that gig. But he says, yeah, I really yeah. don't, I really don't do much outside of that. Because yeah. that, that that gig, he's playing lead on it, and it just takes a lot of a lot of strength to play it. Yeah, the the the, the problem is endurance. One right. loses endurance, Paul. Don't you think so? Oh, absolutely. That that's the hardest thing to keep, uh, you know, in shape. And and something that we've noticed on on our you know tips for trumpeters fifty years uh, is everybody is concerned about endurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What well, we had do? Eric Miyashiro on uh, maybe a month ago or something, Bobby, and and he yeah. was talking about when the f- pandemic first hit and everything. Who, who, who was it? Who was it? I... Uh, Eric Miyashiro. Um, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and and he said he he was just so depressed right after the COVID hit. He didn't play for about a, a, a full month, and he came back and and all the range was there, the flexibility was there, everything was there. Endurance was not. That was the Not. one thing. And yeah, for me, yeah. the same thing. I have to play three times a day and, and try to do something strenuous in each of those three to, to stay in shape. Incredible. Eh? Years, years ago, my wife and I, I flew to Sweden and we decided to, um, in the days of interrailing, we, we went all the way on a train, all the way from... Uh, Sweden, actually, she met me in Holland in Amsterdam. Then we took the train to Sweden, stayed in Sweden for a little bit, and then we went from Sweden all the way down to Greece. I always wanted to see a a lot of these countries that we went through. And we spent maybe a month or five weeks, something like that. And I took my trumpet, but I decided, once I got on the trip, I decided I'm not going to play for this whole trip. I'm just going to, I want to see what happens because I had never, ever (laughs) taken any time off, you know? So I thought, you know, I'll see what happens. I want to enjoy the trip and be with her and this and that. So came back, you know, a month later or whatever it was. And, you know, I I had two things happen. (laughs) I could still play this, the top of my regular range. I, but what I noticed, I had a kind of a fluffy tone and my endurance was gone and then the other thing that lasted for like for me i don't know why but this lasted for like six months it was my accuracy man just being able to just hit notes you know in a certain way at certain times or read things and not crack notes it was frustrating and after that i said i will never take that much time off ever again yeah. and i haven't and i've taken some long trips but i take my mouthpiece or all even if i can just play for maybe 20 minutes a day and that that keeps me that keeps me sure, going sure. it's not the not the it's not perfect it's not the best but at least i can still i can still play when i get back 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the ramp up time is much faster if you've at least got something still happening. Yes, exactly. it's true, it's true, it's true, yeah. You know, sometimes when I'm going on holidays, I, I don't do it very often, but I take my pocket, pocket trumpet, you know. Oh, okay. And then I play every day, every day a little bit, yes, of course, to keep the chops alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, endurance is terrible, terrible. And it, and it's a, it's a big chapter of endurance in the instrument we play. Oh, absolutely. Well, the other thing and part of the reason, you know, we started, you know, this site and all that was to share ideas as we get older, um, how things change, you know, when you're a sports star, like we just had the Super Bowl and they're talking about uh, Tom Brady, who's 42 years old. He's like the oldest uh, quarterback in the NFL and he's had his really long career. He's still able to do it. Most people get hurt or they retire years before that. But I was thinking about this when we first put it all together. And I thought, you know, trumpeters, we're all talking about certain things, but there's no groups out there where people are generally, you know, 50 and above and talking about what happens. And so we've noticed that people have dental problems or health problems and, yeah. and just getting older. I mean, I run a little bit, I exercise, but I can't do what I used to do as, you know, have you, have you experienced, you know, that when you're playing and what do you do to combat, you know, to combat? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. My body's not the same. Listen, I'm 80 years old now. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm 80 years old. You know, it's it's, it's impossible. <laughs> I refuse it. <laughs> but the body tells you. You know, the body tells you, and it's very important to keep um, to keep uh, your body active. But with the pandemic here in Argentina, has been co confinement. You say confinement in English? Confinement, mm. sure. Yeah. Confinement, yeah. So we couldn't go out just to go to the pharmacy or to the store to buy food, but nothing more, you know. So we have to stay at home. So I was walking, going from the from the kitchen to the bathroom, the bathroom to the kitchen. I did like a half an hour walking by myself here. <laughs> and practicing, of course. But um, but it was no good for my body, this, this uh, confinement, confinement. At this age, the muscles goes away very fast because the body is not producing the, the hormones that are necessary to keep your muscles alive, you know? So in, in a way you have to, you have to try to replace that in a way. And I was going to kinesiologist, you say kinesiologist in English? The kinesiologist, yeah. Kinesiologist. Yeah. I have a one institute here, 100 meters from here, just one block from here. Mm -hmm. But I'm afraid to go there because I have a friend of mine that died, passed away as a consequence of going to a kinesiologist. It's, How it's did all that over. Did they, get, they get the COVID from that going there or was it? Yeah, from, because, oh. you know, it's, a, it's an institute. So there are other people to oh, inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then another friend of mine, older than me, much older, 92 years old, needed to have at home. And then, then that, that one that came home to him, it shows that he has COVID too. And he was very unfortunate not to get it then, but and then he got it later, my friend. And he passed away as a consequence of the COVID, mm -hmm. you know. Surrounded my friends, a lot of friends of mine are, are suffering this uh, illness right now. To be 80 years old is not fun to be sick. And it's no, you are and that's, you're, you're in the high risk category. Yeah, that's sure, my father sure. is 88 and he just finally got his vaccinations. Um, but he's been, you know, keeping away and being careful. I just, I told you yesterday, you know, uh, you know, I had a, a close friend that was a bass player. He's like 43 years old and he passed away the other day. So, I mean, some Terrible. people, it's an interesting, an interesting virus because some people don't even feel it, know they have it, and other people die from it. You know, it's, it's 
but it's uh, when you when you when you've had that, I think, or you're close to somebody that's passed away or gotten really sick, it makes you think twice about it. So that's what I mean. To meet to visit the doctor as well, you know. Yeah. To go yeah. and sit down there to wait for the for your turn, you know, in the hospital or whatever. Well, and you Shit. live in a populous, a populate, uh, pop, highly populated city. And now I oh, moved yeah. out of Seattle, so I live, uh, you know, in a small area. I'm still close to it, but I'm away on the other side. On that's the good, that's good. And you, and Paul, so, what, you live in cent center? Uh, well, when I'm home, I'm, I'm outside of the city as well. Yeah, I live on an island that's uh, a little little distance from from Seattle, maybe an hour Very away. Very good. Yeah. Great, great trumpet player from Canada, huh? Kenny Wheeler. Yeah, oh, yeah. Kenny Wheeler, yeah, absolutely, yes. And one. I had the opportunity too. to 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 play several times with him. And, and then Ingrid, Ingrid Jensen. Oh, Ingrid is wonderful. I yeah. I grew up with her. Well, she's actually about. Four years younger than me, she and Diana Crawl, the same uh, graduating high school class together. <laughs> so I, I used to be a teacher's assistant when I was maybe 17 years old um, at a music camp, and and there was Ingrid, and she was, let me see, if I was 17, she was maybe 12 or something. Well, no, I guess maybe 14 or something, and she was already playing great. <laughs> I remember when when I was uh, when Claudio Claudio Roditi and my my and me we were touring Europe, we were many many times in Vienna, in Austria, and she was living there. So she was coming to our gigs, and we invited her to sit down to sit in with us, you know. And she he, she played with she was young, you know, twenty years old or something like this. Wow. Sweets are very nice. Yeah, she very just nice. keeps getting better and better all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tremendous. Well, and Gustavo, then, I know we're, excuse me, I, I wanted to say this. I know we're getting close to the end here, but I also wanted to make people aware here that Gustavo, he's, He's very humble, but he has some amazing recordings out there. You can um, check them out on Amazon, Gustavo Bergali Quintet. We'll put up a, a link to that later. So if you want to go check out uh, some of his stuff, you can, you can see him. Um, really good music. Maybe if you like some of it, maybe uh, take a look at it and you can purchase it there. Uh, and it's available, I think, some still on CD and some on MP3s. So I think everybody should know more about you and have some of your music in their, uh, in their music library and keep it on rotation. I know I, know I do. So... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I, I was, I was, I was. Paul and I will usually end uh, sometimes with with what we call our lightning round, and the lightning round is we're gonna just ask you some random, just a couple of quick random questions. And you just answer with whatever comes to the top of your mind. There's no no right answer or no wrong answer. Okay. Like this psychologist. I well, I guess we're, we'll be doing a Rorschach test tomorrow. But uh, yeah, you free, know. Free, 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 what does free that look like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'll let Paul go first. Uh, what's your favorite food? My favorite food is um, meat on the grill here, asado, the barbecue is the national. National food in Argentina. Wonderful. That is the best. <laughs> it really is. Out of all the theaters you've played in the world, what's your favorite one to play at? Well, here in Buenos Aires, there is the Theater Colón, which is huge. It's, it's amazing, the place. It's amazing. It was uh, built in 1900. And all the great classical artists it was part of the of the tour that that was like a um, New York Lincoln Center or whatever or you know but Cologne Theatre is here and I'm going to play now in March there oh wow with who with your group or is it uh, you know have you heard the name of Astor Piazzolla oh yeah of course sure. well Astor Piazzolla would be 100 years if he would stay alive his grandson is a drummer, and he has a group, and the group is gonna play a kind of a homage concert. Concert. 
-hmm. and they want me to be there. And I was I was friend of Astor Piazzolla. I, I brought Astor Piazzolla to Sweden. And they, they want me to tell some stories about Astor Piazzolla. And I have some of them, some are very, very funny. So I'm going to play a couple of tunes because our, our, our artists are going to be there. And I'll, beside that, I'm going to tell some stories about Astor Piazzolla. Oh, that's going to be great. Are they going to film that? I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know. I, I don't think that it's going to be audience there, you know. I don't know oh. how it's going to be. Well, maybe they're going to broadcast it, you know, so... I let you. I let you know. I let you okay, know. that sounds great. Well, Gustavo, thank you so much for spending time with us. Paul, thanks for being here and helping out. Like always, it's always a, a pleasure yeah. to see you guys, both you guys. Yeah. And Gustavo, I know you have a lot more to tell, and we'll have to bring you back in the future to uh, to do part two. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Bobby. Paul, it was great to meet you. Nice to meet I, you too, sir. <laughs> I, I, I would love, I would love to hear you playing and to to hear everything you do. You must be an amazing trumpet player. Oh, I can he imagine. is. He is. I can imagine. He looks like that. You know. You know. <laughs> you know. <It's> the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> no. Do, did you feel? Do you realize when a musician is a great musician just for seeing that person, the attitude, yeah. how how that person. Act. Miles, Miles Davis used to say that he could tell a person's personality and how they were going to play by watching how they open their trumpet case or their <laughs> instrument case. <laughs> but I can see you that you are a great trumpet player, great musician, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but I would love to hear you playing, really, really. Well, hopefully we can all get together sometime. Bobby says uh, what a great hang it is with you always, Gustavo. And I, I would love to participate in in one of those hangs too sometime. Thank yeah. you, it would be great. great well, good great. good to see you. Thanks again for spending time with us. We really, really th appreciate it. Th thank you, Bobby, very much for this. Thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. And uh, it's a honor. It has been a honor to be with you. Oh, for us too, to, thank you. To change stories and and knowledge and stuff like this. It's well, wonderful. this is, you are a part of history. I had a great, great time. Wonderful. You, you are a part of jazz history, you know, from different parts of the world. So this is really cool to have this. So we appreciate it. And we'll stay in touch. OK. And I say hello to all of the audience, all the people listen to this. Too. A yeah. big hug, to all, big hug yeah. to all of you. All right. Brothers. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Bye bye now. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>